Hey everyone, happy Wednesday. I was going to share with you some things about the virus and what's going on in the world today, but the Lord really impressed upon me to talk to you about Easter and Passover and the resurrection. Because Easter and Passover and the resurrection are all lumped together and they're all a week from Sunday. So join me and we're going to do an in-depth study on the truth of Easter, Passover, and the resurrection. What I would like to discuss today is a story that you probably haven't heard. We in Western culture have sort of conglomerated Passover, Easter, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, these three events are completely separate. They came from completely separate entities, and they mean completely separate things. Now, it is possible, of course, to relate the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the Passover of the Jews because Jesus Christ was the Passover lamb incarnate. So in that way, they're the same, but they're not the same. So we're going to get into that. But for today, we're going to discuss Easter and where Easter came from. What I'm about to tell you is not going to make any sense to you whatsoever. You are going to be very confused, and you are going to doubt that what I'm telling you is true. But trust me, it is. If you want to go and look all this up, you're welcome to do so in the Bible, in the Septuagint, in the Apocrypha, and even on Wikipedia. Please, I encourage you to go look up what I'm telling you and find out the truth. You've been deceived just like I was deceived. Let's get into the story. Noah had three sons, Shem, Hem, and Japheth. Now, we know that there was some situation in Genesis 9 where Noah got drunk and somebody saw him naked and then Noah woke up and cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. He cursed him and there was a sexual perversion that traveled down the line of Ham to Canaan and to his sons and to his brothers. And so, that's where we're going to pick up the story. We're going to pick up the story with a man named Nimrod, and he was in Genesis 9, 10, and 11. Nimrod was very powerful. He was extremely intelligent. He was one of the descendants of Ham. So what we find is that this sexual perversion is a curse that was pronounced by Noah on Canaan, but that perversion permeated the family line. And so we have Nimrod, who's also engaging in sexual perversion, but he's extremely intelligent and he's very, very talented. So what he does is he conquers most of the people, which are already his family members, because remember, everybody at that time came from these three boys that were Noah's boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so all of the people on earth at that time were of the same gene pool. They were basically all the same family. And so it was very easy for Nimrod to gain their trust and to gain their following. So what happens is Nimrod goes and he is in charge of basically the populated world at this time. The largest and densest population on earth was in Babel, which is modern day Iraq. Well, Nimrod has this huge following. He's what we call a potentate, which means he is a super king, kind of like what Hitler wanted to do, kind of like what Artaxerxes wanted to do. Also Napoleon. Every conqueror that we find throughout history has the same spirit. They want to take over the world. They want to be the only one in charge and the only one with ultimate and supreme power. Basically, this is the knowledge of the wicked one wanting to take the place of God in the hearts of men and in the earth realm. So that's exactly what Nimrod wanted to do. That was his entire purpose. So he gets everyone together and he says, I want to do something. I don't like how God wiped out the earth with a flood. So to keep ourselves protected from a God that could do this potentially to his people, we're going to build a tower. Now remember that God had promised in Genesis 8 that he would never again flood the earth. And he gave to mankind the rainbow as a sign that he would keep his promise. I know that it's been taken over by a completely degenerate population now. And it's so interesting to me that that sign, the sign of the rainbow, that God would never flood the earth again, has been adopted by people who have sexual 
perversions. And I know that if you're homosexual, if you are at all perverse in your sexuality, meaning you're not heterosexual, you think that you're normal, but I can tell you that God did not design you this way. He did not put two males in the Garden of Eden. He did not put two females in the Garden of Eden. He put a male and a female. You were not designed to be homosexual no matter what you've been told, period. And it's so interesting to me that the sign of God's promise has been adopted by people who are trying to be accepted by culture and by God for their sexual perversions. That's just a very interesting point aside that has nothing to do with Easter. So what we have now is we have Nimrod saying to all these people, I don't think God is going to keep his word. I think he's going to flood the earth again. God cannot be trusted. That's exactly the same methodology that the devil used in the garden when he talked to Eve. God cannot be trusted. You aren't like God already. You need to eat this fruit so that you can be like God. God. And so that's the same concept here. Nimrod is saying, God's not telling the truth. He's not allowing you part of his life. And I am your protector. I am your salvation. I am your savior. So what he does is he says, let's build a tower. I know you're thinking, what does this have to do with Easter? This whole story has to do with Easter. And it's going to take me a lot of videos to get through this entire story because this is a huge, huge story. It has been very impactful and we have been indoctrinated with a falsehood. Even in the churches, you will go, probably not right now because of the lockdown that the entire world is under. But normally, if you go to a church during Easter, they have Easter egg hunts and they have the Easter bunny and all this stuff. And you find a lot of people who aren't Christians who normally don't go to church, going to church on Easter. And so it's like the largest amount of of salvations that they have a year. It's even more than Christmas because Easter talks about the resurrection of Christ. And so this is wrong because Easter and the resurrection do not go together. We're going to get to why they were forced together and what happened. But right now, let's talk about Easter and where Easter came from. So we have this tower that Nimrod wants to build to keep the people safe from God. He wants to get up to heaven and he wants to build it so high that if God sends another flood, that the people will be protected. So what Nimrod proposes is actually a marvel, a feat of engineering. In fact, in this ancient world that you think is just made up of cavemen, or if you buy in and subscribe to the concept of Darwinianism, that these people are apes in their intellect and apes in their behavior, you are a extremely mistaken and I can prove it because not only does the Bible but all kinds of extra biblical texts from the Babylonians, from the Persians, from the Greeks all give us the story of the Tower of Babel or Babel whichever one you want to say. They all do. It doesn't just come from the Bible and there is a reason for that. So these people were not stupid. What Nimrod proposed was making bricks out of mud and then putting them in a kiln or firing the bricks. And he then decided to extract asphalt from the ocean. And that's what they use as pitch or as chinking between the bricks to build the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was a mile and a half high before God stopped it. It was a little over a mile and a half around. Do you know that there, as of 2019, there is not a building that is as high as the Tower of Babel on this earth. There never has been. The highest building as of 2019, the highest building on earth is in Dubai. And it measures at just over a half a mile high. That includes all of its uninhabitable peaks and ornate furnishings at the top of the building where people can't even go. Even at the very tip, tip, tip top, it's just over half a mile high. So I want you to think about this. Any notion that you had of people in ancient times being ignorant Neanderthal cavemen people just one step above an ape is absolutely ludicrous. Look at what they did. Let me just ask you this. How do you think that they extracted the asphalt from the ocean? That's a really great question. And how could people who are of very small intellect even construct something like that? They can't. 
they were not operating at eight or nine percent brain capacity, which is what we're operating at. These people were close to a hundred percent brain capacity. They weren't that far removed from Adam. They knew exactly what they were doing. Not only that, but they all still spoke the same language. The largest takeaway that people have from the Tower of Babel is that God separated the languages. Yes, that's what happened, but we have to look at what was going on in the 43 years between the beginning of construction and the time that God stopped the construction of the Tower of Babel. We have to look at what was happening in this population during those 43 years because it's so important for not only world history, but it's important for the story of Easter. So what is happening is Nimrod is building this Tower of Babel and it is employing the large portion of the population. Intelligent people, it pays the best. They're working for the king of the world, basically. So this is where you want to be. And everybody else occupies support positions. So everybody is focused in the whole world, in the whole population. They're all focused on this tower. So Nimrod is in a particular position of power. And he decides that he wants all the power. He wants to be worshipped. Because why? Because the devil that was influencing Cain, that was influencing everybody before the flood, is the same devil that's influencing Nimrod. And Nimrod says, I want to be worshipped like God is worshipped. So he comes up with these worship ceremonies. And they are extremely sexual and perverted in nature. Two of the worship ceremonies that you are sure to recognize are, one, there are temple prostitutes, right? You go to the temple to worship Nimrod and you have to have sex with a prostitute. Does that sound familiar? How many times have you been into a, have you gone into a church and been hit on by somebody in the church, men or women? It's exactly the same thing. How many times have you gone into a church and the pastor is messing with another woman in the church. How many times have you heard of giant clergies messing with little boys that are supposed to be worshiping God? It's exactly the same thing. And it started right here with Nimrod. The other thing that you're gonna notice is the Asher pole. It was actually a sign to show how virile Nimrod was, how able he was to repopulate the earth. Remember, the earth's population was entirely wiped out with the flood except for eight people, Noah, his wife, their three boys, and their three boys' wives. So these eight people had to entirely repopulate the earth. So you know what happened? They were extremely fertile, and everybody was extremely fertile because God had a purpose in repopulating the earth. Well, they were deranged and thought that they were just able to just make babies all the time, which for a while they were. So all of their worth came out of being able to impregnate women or carry babies. That sounds like the Nazis, right? Because the Nazis had exactly the same thing going on. The Nazis said, all these women have to produce for Germany, and so we're going to take the restrictions off, and nobody has to be married. We're just going to allow our Nazi Aryan race to be impregnated into the Nazi Aryan women and we're just going to produce babies. And that's exactly what Nimrod was doing. But this purpose was to repopulate the earth under the command of God. So this is how people got their value. If, if a man had a lot of ability to produce children, if a woman had a lot of ability to nurse a lot of children, these were more valuable people in this time. And so that is what the currency was. That's why we have temple worship giving your seed, as it were, to the king and not to God. And so Nimrod, he was the ultimate virile leader. And so as a worship act toward Nimrod, people were required in public and in private to erect phallic poles. These would take the form of something as short as a maypole outside that people would dance around or even as tall as something like the Washington Monument. That's what the public phallic pole was. And the personal phallic pole would have been a stripper pole inside a house. Okay, it would have been anything that represented Nimrod's penis. I know that this is a little bit vulgar for you, but this is exactly what happened. So Nimrod has all these people going around dancing on stripper poles and having sex with all these people and that's how he gets his power because he can produce more babies than anybody else. So he 
is in charge and he takes a wife. Well, interestingly enough, the one thing that Nimrod was known for, his sexuality, God has has restricted him from producing an heir. God said, this is enough of this bull crap and you're not having no more babies that are legitimate to your throne because I want this throne to stop. So Nimrod has a wife and her name is Semiramis and she's completely barren. At try as he may, Nimrod cannot produce an heir with Semiramis. Well, all of a sudden, all this sexual activity and all of this activity in Nimrod's life finally gets to him and he dies. Now, there's some confusion about how Nimrod actually died. Some people say that um, he was murdered by his uncles who were serving the Lord. Some people say that he was killed in hunting accidents. We don't really know actually how Nimrod died, which is very interesting because we know most of the rest of the story. So Nimrod dies. Well, Semiramis has no heir, remember, because she didn't have any children with Nimrod. So she has no heir to the throne. So her entire power play is based on having children and also being able to bear children. And she's scared to death that she is going to lose the kingdom and all the power and the money and the privilege that comes with it. So she concocts the most ludicrous story. Remember I told you that these people were very intelligent. They have constructed an engineering marvel that has not even been outdone today with our standards and our ability. These people were not dummies. They weren't hillbillies. They weren't apes. They weren't cavemen. These brilliant people believe this stupid story. They believed what Semiramis told them. And Semiramis told them that Nimrod died and he became the sun. This is the very first mention that we have in world history of anything similar to reincarnation. This is where it came from. It came from Semiramis's stupid and depraved mind. She said that Nimrod became the sun. And these same intelligent people who followed their god, Nimrod, into this massive building project believed that their god was now the sun. Now, what kind of sense does that make? Because the sun existed way before Nimrod became the sun. So even a logical mind says that's crap. And so, but they bought it hook, line, and sinker. And they continued with their worship practices. Well, some time goes by and Semiramis starts to lose her grip on the people. And so what does she do? She decides she's going to take up lovers and she's going to get impregnated. But she can't get a husband because then the husband, of course, will take her power. And she doesn't want to let the people know that she has been unfaithful to her husband because he's still around, right? He's still the son and he's all seeing and all knowing and he would know if she was unfaithful to him. So she concocts this cockamamie story that she's worshiping her husband by laying out on the ground one day and that his rays impregnate her. Nine months later, of course, she gives birth to a child, a male child, and she calls his name Tammuz. Well, what I want to point out here is that this is where sun god worship comes from. This is where all of, if you look at you're going to see, if you look at all of the cultures around the world, you'll see that they all worship the sun. And it comes from right here. How do you suppose that all the cultures who all speak different languages, who are on different continents, all worship the sun in exactly the same way. We're going to get to that. And it all has to do with Easter, okay? So, now we have Semiramis giving birth to Tammuz. And the entire population of the world is so happy that now they have the son of their god, right? And now they have a savior, who's going to save them from the god who would potentially destroy them with a flood. So Tammuz takes over where his father left off, and he begins reconstruction or construction again on the Tower of Babel. Well, Tammuz is way worse and more wicked than his father. So he goes out and he is, of course, participating in all this sexual immorality, of course, impregnating all these women and adding to all these worship standards and then one day he goes hunting and he's hunting hogs and he gets hooked by a, a hog, by a boar, and it kills him. Tammuz was 40 years old when he was killed by this hog. So when the news comes back that their beloved Tammuz, the child of Nimrod, is dead, Semiramis again comes up with a story that they want to show their worship. They want to show their love 
to Tammuz and thereby to Nimrod. So they decide they're going to kill the pig on Nimrod's birthday. It, symbolically, if you take our Lord, we're going to take you. You took his life, we're going to take your life. So as an honorary tribute to Tammuz, everybody in the world is required to, on Tammuz's birthday, slaughter a hog and eat it. They eat ham on Tammuz's birthday. Well, that's not enough for them. So they decide that they are going to honor Tammuz on the days leading up to his birthday. They're going to make it a whole celebration, one day for every year of his life. So 40 days prior to the birthday of Tammuz, the entire world gives up something that is very dear to them, that they like to indulge in. So this presents itself as not eating meat, not drinking wine, not other indulgences for 40 days. So this results in the entire world giving up something meaningful to them for the 40 days just prior to Tammuz's birthday. This is where we get the idea of Lent. This is where Lent came from. It has nothing to do with Christ. Zero. People have twisted it and turned it to try to put it in to the Christianity box, and that came with Constantine. We're going to get to that a little bit later in another video. But this is where Lent came from. It was sun god worship. The priests that worship Nimrod said, to honor the sun, you have to give up something that means something to you for Lent for Tammuz. And the reason they did this is that they believed that Tammuz was also reincarnated. And so they were giving up something like meat or drinking wine or whatever, so that Tammuz could have it in the spiritual realm. They believe that if you gave it up in the natural realm, then the, then whatever God you were worshiping could receive it in the spiritual wor world, but only if you gave it up. And so that's where the idea of Lent comes from. That is completely, completely against God, and it is pagan sun god worship. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this video now, and next week we're going to continue with the story of Tammuz and Semiramis and where Easter comes from. Where, did, where do Easter eggs come from? How did the bunny rabbit get involved in this entire story? Why do we put it on the same day as Resurrection Day? Why do we do that? And what in the world does it have to do with Passover? We're going to answer all these questions and more in this video series, so please don't miss a moment. Remember that I love you, but most of all, Jesus loves you.